uh, uh, ESI Smackdown. And, uh, it should be a lot of fun and uh, no holds bar for uh, tonight and respectful debate on the question of should we uh, pick winners and losers. Uh, and I want to um, also thank our co host here, Mike uh, Prestowitz, with the Economic Strategy Institute. This is an event that's co sponsored by both IPIF and ESI. And now uh, it's my pleasure to turn it over to our moderator uh, this morning, who uh, we really couldn't have asked for a better moderator for this topic. Uh, most of you know Jim Fallows or his work. Uh, Jim is a national correspondent uh, for The Atlantic, and uh, really is, I think, one of the most thoughtful commentators on the state of the U.S. economy today. He's written a number of pieces on this in the last two years, which has been uh, very, very insightful. Uh, he's been at the Atlantic for more than 25 years, just got back from a stint in China for, he must have been four times? Seems like that, three. Three, seems like that. Uh, he has spent two years as a chief White House speechwriter for President Jimmy Carter, two years as editor of U.S. News and World Report. He's also a program designer at Microsoft, and uh, he's also an instrument-rated private pilot. So with that, we'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you all our, our participants here. Thank you all for coming out this morning. I am really looking forward to this event. We know that in the world of public policy, there are issues that come and go, and there are long internal uh, divisions of opinion and uh, values that we have. And I think we have a chance with four of the leading proponents and thinkers and practitioners on the issue that's before us this morning to have a formal structured debate. Um, I think, I'm sure that everybody in this room has heard issues of industrial policy, whether it's feasible or not, or desirable or not, discussed over the years, probably by some of the people we've we'll learned from this morning. I don't think we ever heard it uh, examined in just this way, because we're going to have a formal, good, clean fight style structured debate. For those of you who um, have grown a little easy on this since your days as college debaters, I will remind you, we're going to do it uh, by the following rules. We're going to have first a six minute opening statement by the affirmative team, the team supporting the proposition that the U.S. government can and should pick winners, by which we mean the government should rely not only on the market, but also by setting a comprehensive national strategy for boosting competitiveness, et cetera. We sure the proposition defended by the affirmative team. We'll have a six minute statement by the first affirmative, and we then will have a three minute question period of the presenter by one of the negative teams, followed by the and then the negative opening statement, six minutes, three minutes Q&A, and on through the whole process. We're going to have a rebuttal round. Um, as, with, uh, as in courtroom proceedings, since the burden of proof is on the affirmative, the affirmative will have both the first and the last word. So we'll have a double negative uh, segment in the middle that you'll see. Um, I will be keeping time on the speakers as they make their presentation while they're sitting here conveniently in their eye line. And whenever any of them has one minute to go, either on an opening presentation or a QA, and I'll hold up a one minute signal. When there are zero minutes to go, I will stand up and come back up here to the podium. And although it means a lot of stage business, we'll have the people doing the speaking do so from here. And after the debate portion is over, we'll have some questions and discussion. We'll be actually just sitting here, panel style. I'll say only a word about each of our, um, our speakers today because I believe you know you certainly know of them, you probably know them too from over the years. One of our hosts is Clyde Prestwitz of the Economic Strategy Institute. Clyde and I have uh, first met in Japan uh, 25 years ago or so when you already were you were talking about um, ha having a, a worldview on what was going wrong between Japan, the U.S., and the rest of the world. So Clyde has, has been a very influential author of, uh, of countless books. Um, Rob Atkinson, who's also our host here from ITIF, has, has uh, been very influential in recent debates about how the industries of the future can be affected by the interaction of the market and state policy. Robert Z. Lawrence of the Kennedy School is somebody who I have uh, listened to and learned from over the years. He's had a, some of the, the earliest and most influential writings about where the benefits of trade and trade policy really did fall, whether it was uh, in which ways it was productive or not for states to intervene. And Claude Barrio from the American Enterprise Institute has also been an influential voice of reason and skepticism of the kind of proposition we're hearing this morning. So that is the lineup of speakers you will hear. I couldn't imagine four more well-matched heavyweight contenders in the policy and intellectual sense. As fiscal specimens, they're all trim and models to us all. But as contenders, they're the heavyweight we're looking for. 
for us. <laughs> we have a, we, we're going to have uh, an additional uh, tone of excitement here of voting to see whether minds are changed during the course of the debate. So Steve Norton is going to come up and tell you how the voting system works. So you're going to vote before the discussion on how you feel about the proposition, and then after the formal debate, you're going to vote on how you feel then, and see whether there was any marginal movement one way or the other. So uh, you tell us what you think about the, uh, the process. Well, it's, it's really, really you use the mic, because we have okay. people uh, watching yeah. on that. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we hope. Um, this is the instruction. There are basically three ways to cast your vote. You can, um, if, I see some of you have laptops, and I know some folks watching the, uh, the video, I mean the uh, live stream, uh, you can go to the website, poll4.com, <coughs> and probably the easiest way, if anybody has their Blackberry or handheld device, is just to send a text message. And what you will do is you will you will um, you will text you will see I can see the number what is it? nine five nine nine five 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 three. that's the one okay and then you will cast your vote you see where it says agree disagree unsure there's numbers at the bottom you use that number as your response vote so. Uh, what I would do is invite you to cast your votes now, and you will see on the screen uh, how people decide uh, what, what, what people's inclination is right now. And so while you're doing that, we can maybe get on with the debate, and then maybe 10 minutes before the end, we'll do the same with a post-debate poll, to see if anybody's going to change. Yes, and as <coughs> I've encouraged our protagonists here to have a, to have a good, clean fight, um, I will encourage everybody to cast a good, clean, honest vote. <laughs> that is, while we're going to look for movement, please honestly state what your views are now so we can see whether they, they have honestly changed as time goes on. So that is the plan. And I believe, um, Rob, are you going to go first? So leading off with a six-minute first affirmative presentation, I give you Rob Atkinson. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I want to start by saying that what um, is essentially uh, an ideological statement put forth principally by neoclassical economists that the U.S. should not pick winners uh, really at the end of the day only serves to stop and not advance the kind of reasoned analysis and discussion we have to have in this country about what our economic and technology policy needs to be. So essentially, this whole notion of picking winners and losers is, a, is designed to stop serious thought. Let me suggest that before I say why we do need to pick winners and losers, or why we need to pick winners, uh, that we need to think about what the continuum is. On the one hand, there's a continuum of doing nothing, sort of leaving it up to the market, because the market is all wise and leads to Pareto optimality and everything is going to work. Uh, to something next, which would be supporting what we call factor conditions. In other words, it's the role of government is to help with things like a good uh, science base uh, and helping with uh, funding researchers and the like. Uh, to a third piece, which would be to pick key technologies and industries that we think are going to be important for the nation. That's essentially the position that Clyde and I will take today. That we do think we should and can pick winning technologies and winning industries, uh, and that's important for the future of our country. There's a fourth step, which I think Clyde and I would say is not appropriate, and that's you don't want to go so far down the path of picking that you end up doing what some of the Europeans and Asians have done, of picking individual national champions, nor do you want to go so far down on the technology spectrum that you're picking very, very narrow technologies to preclude other types of technology. So for example, we would argue we need a national battery policy, uh, but we don't know what the right battery technology is going to be. Uh, so battery technology policy wouldn't pick lithium batteries only if it would be a broad scope of saying we think batteries are critical to the future of this country, we need a battery technology. So why do we need to pick winners? The basic bottom line is that some industries and technologies are more important than others. They drive innovation, <coughs> they drive exports, they drive productivity, and they support high wages more than others. Uh, this is essentially stating that there is a fundamental difference between computer chips and potato chips. A dollar of potato chips is not equal to a dollar of computer chips. The computer chips are worth a lot more. But in the market only, if we rely only on the market, we'll get potato chips and computer chips. If we get more compu computer, if we get more potato chips, we get fat. If we get more computer chips, we get rich. It's a big difference. 
Okay, so why do we need to do that? Why won't the market do this? Uh, essentially, I would argue neoclassical economists, and I assume our opponents this morning, uh, oppose picking winners because the right industrial structure, the right technology structure is one that the market provides. Uh, because by definition, market exchanges, the price intermediated market exchanges are what are called Pareto optimal. You can't make anybody better off because each, each part of the transaction is better off. But that assumes, uh, as we like to know, let's say in economics, economics is all about assumption. Uh, it assumes a whole set of things which just aren't true. Uh, and in, in, in fact, there are a set of market failures, or what other types of market like externalities, that are endemic to the economy, and they're endemic particularly to high-tech industries and high-tech markets. But let me just mention a few of these. Uh, benefits spill over. So we all know that research spills over and that companies can't capture all of it. But there are spillovers that are different by different types of technology. So just assuming that they're going to be the same. Some, certain technologies have fast spillovers, others have less. Uh, IT investment, for example. There's very good work by Lauren Kidd at Penn that shows that for every dollar that a company invests in IT, society gets another dollar. So because of that, economies will underinvest in IT because of that spillover. Uh, the whole notion of general purpose technologies, which a lot of economists have talked about, <coughs> technologies that are imbued throughout the economy that drive productivity and growth in many, many sectors, and in particularly IT, there's a whole slew of research that shows that GPTs have four to five times more impact uh, than regular technologies. And so if we rely on the market, we're going to underinvest in general purpose technologies. There are a whole set of other market failures, time horizons. And it's pretty clear that US companies have shifted their time horizons to much more shorter market time horizons. And because of that, they're doing less basic and applied research. There's a whole set of time horizons around first mover advantages. If companies can get a first mover advantage, uh, they're able to gain, uh, bring down prices, get innovation, and as a result, gain market share. We shouldn't be indifferent to that kind of uh, dynamic. Uh, other types of uh, market failures, chicken or egg externalities, uh, chicken or egg network externalities, whole technologies like digital signature, mobile payments, high-speed broadband, intelligent transportation systems, uh, health IT, these are all technologies that one individual firm cannot do, or in a very difficult way, do on its own. It's these technologies to emerge in the marketplace are dependent upon other actors acting at the same time. So you have a whole set of coordination factors, <coughs> cluster externality. In regional clusters around the country, the benefits of one firm doing better spill over to all the firms in that cluster. We don't account for that solely in the market. Uh, and finally, high-wage, high-value added economic base. There's this notion in neoclassical economics, we don't need to pick winners and losers because the market will get us there. Because what we want is what's called equilibrium. There's a lot of new evidence, particularly a very nice study by uh, an economist, uh, Elvayo Asenoli, which finds that in a neoclassical, uh, you can have two equilibriums, one high-wage, one low-wage. So that's why we need to pick winners and losers, win winners, <laughs> because the market is not going to do it for us. Thank you. Now, you may stay at the stand at the podium for your three-minute cross-examination by Mr. Barfield. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I basically have two questions. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to do the question and the answer. Yes, you can both. No, just stand up. You're having a call to Is that correct? One, uh, this has been in your writings and, and others uh, of your field this morning. Uh, so this whole business is about neoclassic economic economics. Uh, it seems to me that it's not just neoclassical economics. Economics profession, with sort of minor exception. So I'd like to you to explain how neoclassical economists fit with larger economists. The second, and I should say that um, I don't know what you what you call Robert Solo, a neoclassical economist or whatever. But in terms of what you just laid out here, Solo famously <coughs> said something I mean, several decades ago. You know, I know that there are technologies and sectors where there are spillovers for society that is big spillovers, and that our society would gain a lot more if we could just invest it. But my problem is, I don't know which ones they are. <laughs> and I think recently, Judge Barguati in a book said, well, you know, we economists <coughs> don't know where the spillovers are, but, it, but private interest groups think they know, and they will tell the government. So how 
how, how do you, well, by what means have you decided on this list? We've had a list of strategic technologies for the last 20 years. How, how, did, how does one decide? How can you tell? You listed the whole group. But. Sure, no. Look, I think um, the problem with economics is that the notion that neo neoclassical economics is defined as economics by neoclassical economists. There are, in fact, a whole set of other schools of thought in economics, such as endogenous, uh, what people call endogenous growth theory, neo schubertarianism institutional economics, <coughs> evolutionary economics, Richard Nelson's work at, at, uh, at Columbia, for example. So in that sense, yes, I am, I am targeting the neoclassical framework, but there's a whole set of other people who are doing economics that, that have a distinctly different view that it is not sort of market-based, but rather institution-based, and I think that's uh, that's a big difference. With regard to uh, Solo, I mean, look, Solo did a lot of amazing work, uh, but within the neoclassical framework, <coughs> one of the great quotes from Robert Solo is, "Innovation is, is manna from heaven." Uh, that, that only thing that meant was he had no clue about innovation. He doesn't really know how it comes, so it must come from heaven. Uh, clearly, innovation is not manna from heaven. Clearly, innovation is something that we do. And, and how do we know what to do? Well, one way we do it is we rely on research. So there are a whole set of uh, studies out there uh, about types of technologies that have big impact. So I'm more than happy to say that definitively right now, we do know that IT has a bigger impact than non-IT. Uh, we do know, for example, that we're going to need clean energies in the future. So we, it, it's, I, I agree, it's not a science, but certainly we can use informed analysis to figure out what are the general areas that we need to do as a society. We have 10 seconds if you have any closing points. <laughs> I would only say that you, know, you take Richard Nelson as, a, as an institutional as opposed to neoclassical, I don't know what he would call himself, but he is against the same skepticism of the kind of intervention he talked to throughout his career. It's hardly a market fundamentalist. Can we continue? We now have our first negative presentation from Robert Lawrence for six minutes. And I'll, I'll give you five and, and two countdowns. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to renew this, uh, this debate. Um, firstly, I want to make it clear, um, I teach economics. And uh, I've just been teaching a trade policy course. And in the first two lectures, I explain a competitive market. After that, I explain what happens when a market has imperfections. So this whole idea that somehow economists are blind to the imperfections of markets, uh, regardless of how you classify them, is totally absurd. It does not represent any kind of uh, academically um, uh, significant thinking. We have spent a lot of time thinking about market imperfections and market failures. The real debate between us is not whether the market is perfect or not, or whether it, there isn't some role for government, but rather, what should that role for government be? And in my view, and in our view, there is a role legitimately for the government, uh, in particular, in providing the public goods which the private market will not provide on its own. And if we talk about the area in which we are uh, um, uh, focusing on technology. Clearly, the government, and our government has significant deficits, has to improve our infrastructure for technology. The physical infrastructure of this country is degraded. That's a legitimate role for government. The government has to provide regulatory frameworks. Um, ours, uh, are clearly in the financial area, have been broken. We need to re restructure our financial sector so that those in the investments being made are focused not simply on financial engineering, but on real engineering. So these are legitimate challenges, and we are in favor of them. Now let's take research and development. Particularly as you get to the commercial end, the, prime, the government doesn't have the foggiest idea where the future uh, technologies are going to pay off commercially. Ultimately, our goal here is pay off commercial. We have the most <coughs> advanced system of venture capitalists, of financial institutions that are exploring where commercial payoffs will come. That is not a role for the government. Now, the government can use tools to deal with the market failures. So let me give you an example. We do know that a 
private market will underperform <coughs> in research and development because private um, uh, entrepreneurs cannot capture the full benefits. Rob gave us the example of information technology. So think about an R&D tax credit. An R&D tax credit does not pick technologies. It simply enhances the very activity that we are trying to encourage. That's the right approach. Let the market respond, but create an incentive system that aligns public and private incentives. Let me give you another example, which is energy policy. Energy policy. Well, here's my energy policy. Let us promise let us set as the government, uh, uh, ensure that the price of CO2 is going to rise over time. Let's make sure that it's, it starts at, at $10 a ton, it's going to be $100 a ton in five years' time, and we can guarantee that using either a cap-and-trade system or a tax. And that's enough. Because when our private sector appreciates that the price of R&D, um, that the price of CO2 is going to rise, and we give them certainty about that, they will go off and decide whether it's biofuels, or whether it's conservation, or whether it's nuclear, or whether it's wind. <coughs> Instead, as a res what we have is a government that is sticking its fingers into a multiplicity of technologies where it doesn't have the foggiest idea about where the major payoffs are going to come. So the bottom line is, let's create incentives, the right system of incentives, for the private sector to search and respond. That is what America does best. So the debate between us on the should question <coughs> is whether the government should be involved in isolating these technologies or whether the private sector should be responding to the right set of investments. Clyde will continue our onslaught by asking the question of whether our government in the United States actually can implement the policies that they are advocating, even assuming it should. Thank you. So a three minute interrogation from one of the members of your team. One of the things that I love about Bob Lawrence is that he's a closet industrial policy. <laughs> <laughs> really nice. um, Bob, you uh, agree that the government should, uh, uh, to some extent, get in this game with uh, investment tax credits or R&D tax credits, uh, funding research, etc. But the crunch question really comes uh, in a way after the initial innovation. Andy Grove has just developed a uh, a neat set of graphs that shows that the U.S. is very good at doing startups. But what happens is then that when it comes time to scale up, the U.S. falls out of bed. And one of the reasons it falls out of bed is because uh, other countries uh, <coughs> take an initial idea and really push it. China right now is pushing photovoltaic cells, for example. We used to be the leader on that. We're not anymore. China is pushing it. We stopped pushing it. So the question really is this. Uh, once you've, your, your R&D has paid off, you have the innovation, uh, and then another country comes along with an industrial policy targeting that, providing uh, capital subsidies, protection, etc., would you uh, have the U.S. government respond in some fashion? Uh, Clyde, you asked a very good question. So we have the technology. Now the question is, where should we manufacture? That does require a, an environment in which the manufacturers think it's attractive to locate in the United States. So we have to make the United States an attractive place to locate manufacturing. Now, we saw, uh, we didn't invent the fine cars, uh, the fine small cars that the Japanese did, but they decided to come here and to manufacture in the United States because they thought the economics made sense. So I'm not averse to the idea that we create an environment which is attractive as a location for manufacturing. That would require an exchange rate that is competitively valued. That would require tax policies, certain tax policies, certain regulatory policies. 
And then I want uh, uh, those firms to make the decisions on a profit basis. I don't want the government interfering and trying to um, force firms to, make, uh, to uh, produce in one location or another. Because at the end of the day, what we've seen is a fragmentation of the global production chain. And um, products today no longer have identities, <coughs> national identities. Technologies do not have national identities. The global supply chain effectively being exploited requires firms to be free to choose where the different segments of the production activity will be located. So this idea that the government should um, somehow be inducing the firms who innovate to locate something here, um, I think goes beyond their legitimate uh, uh, competence. With that, we now move seamlessly to the second affirmative presentation. Uh, so, so now it's time for, for, for quite an actual presentation. So this is a six-minute presentation and then followed by the question and slide. Well, I will make two or three key points. First is that governments really cannot avoid the most of the policy. Uh, they have to make choices. They, they have armies and navies. They have uh, uh, <coughs> telecommunication systems. They have uh, health care systems. Uh, they have budgets. They have to decide how they're going to spend the funds. Uh, NIH spends uh, more money on biotech research than the rest of the world combined. Many universities and many uh, startup companies are wholly dependent on NIH. Somebody at NIH has to decide where the money goes, and there has to be some criteria to do that. Uh, and NIH seems to do it pretty well. Uh, think about uh, the spectrum. We have a, a Federal Communication Commission that has to allocate the, uh, the radio telegraphic spectrum. Have to be choices. Uh, no choices will determine industrial structure. Think about um, the, uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, maybe you don't want to think about it these days. <laughs> uh, it was a failure of industrial policy uh, that led, uh, in part, to the economic crisis that we were suffering. Uh, so I think you really can't avoid it. And the question then, Bob asked the right question, how does the government decide? And the trick here then, if you get a bad industrial policy, you have good industrial trick is, okay, how do you develop the criteria to get to make the right kinds of choices? Uh, other governments, as I pointed out, do have policies. Other governments really don't have this debate. China has a full-blown industrial policy. Singapore, Taiwan, uh, Germany, uh, uh, virtually all the other developed countries have, to the extent of the U.S., uh, the Anglos, the U.S. and the U.K. Now, here's the interesting thing. I was in a White House discussion recently in which the question was, uh, how do we achieve uh, development and growth in green technologies here in the US? Particularly, the question was, how do we revitalize the middle class and how do we revitalize the Midwest? And can we take some of those uh, auto parts plants that have been closing up and turn them into window factories or uh, photovoltaic cell factories or what have you? Uh, and one uh, team of, uh, of White House advisors argued, yeah, we can. Uh, and uh, let's have some uh, <coughs> government programs to fund uh, development of wind, build uh, uh, wind generation. <coughs> but another group said, wait, wait, wait. Um, actually, the uh, Danes and the Germans and the Japanese and the Koreans are ahead of us in this technology. We'd be better off just buying the batteries and windmills from them uh, and um, getting the, those inexpensive uh, components uh, and then uh, just uh, providing the energy to our consumers. Uh, and so there was this big debate, and, and the one side was saying, we need to leave this to market forces. Now the question is, what are the market forces here? Germany, Denmark, Japan, Korea, Taiwan are subsidizing heavily those technologies. So the market is the government, the, the industrial policies of those countries. And, and I submit that that is not uh, a, a, a decision not to respond to those policies is a decision by the United States not to be in uh, the, the production and the development of the future technology of those industries. Now the funny thing is that the United States has, for most of its history, been a strong supporter of industrial policy. 
the myth that the U.S. got rich on the basis of uh, <coughs> free markets uh, and entrepreneurial uh, virtuosity is just that, a myth. Uh, the founding fathers were well aware of Adam Smith and rejected it. Uh, they chose the American system. They chose the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson at Versailles found that Brits were reading his mail. He called his Secretary of the Navy, a guy named Frank Roosevelt, said, Frank, we need a company that can beat British Marconi so the Brits don't read my telegraph trail. Frank Roosevelt called in the heads of AT&T, United Fruit, Westinghouse, and GE, and said, guys, we're going to form a company to beat British Marconi. The US Navy is going to own 50% of it. And they did. And the name of that company is RCA. Uh, the US government ran a huge industrial policy during the first, the first and second world wars and achieved dominance in, in uh, industry and technology as a result. Now, today, the U.S. has an industrial policy. Our de facto industrial policy is this. We subsidize agriculture, uh, the banking system. We uh, favor uh, uh, travel by, uh, by air and by road over rail. We uh, heavily support medical research. We support, uh, we subsidize consumption. And we effectively have decided by by acquiescing in foreign industrial policies, we've decided effectively to move the production of tradable goods and the provision of tradable services offshore. That's our industrial policy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, one of the negative team, a three-minute questioning of uh, of Clyde. So, Clyde, you um, you gave us this example of the green technology. Uh, that was being discussed in the White House. <coughs> and uh, one of the concerns that I have in both the presentations is what exactly is the goal? What do we mean by a winner? You see, in the discussion you described, um, some people wanted to restore the Midwest. Some people like the idea of wind technology. Some people like the idea of high wage industry. Some people want to create high value added industries. So what are precisely the criteria that we're going to look for in these technologies? You see, the point is, if we don't know precisely what we're looking for, how do we ever know whether we have succeeded or failed? So if you came up to me, if you give me a precise um, uh, definition of what your goal is, then I'm gonna be able to know what a winner is. So my question is, what is the precise nature of your goal that will judge whether the policy is successful or not? Well, in that particular case, there were several criteria. One was uh, revitalizing the Midwest, creating jobs. One was creating good jobs, high, high value added, high paying jobs. Second criteria was maintaining a competitive US uh, technological base. Feeling being that uh, if we're not doing research in a number of these technologies, we're not going to be having students studying those things. And so the knowledge base will be, the, the innovation ecostructure will be huge. Uh, and so the thought uh, being proposed was that these are technologies, photovoltaic cells, uh, <coughs> wind uh, uh, generators, batteries, in which the US has in the past uh, been competitive in which it has strong capabilities, in which there's no reason that it cannot be competitive in the future, and these industries provide high wage, high value added jobs, and they support the R&D for a competitive technological base. And therefore, why not, since the market is being distorted by foreign industrial policies, why not at least respond to that distortion so that the market forces will allow American entrepreneurialism and innovativeness to do what it has always done, without. One of the deep insights of neoclassical economics is that each goal you have, if you have a goal, you need an instrument. You cannot hit a target um, uh, with an, if you have more than two targets, you need two arrows. So the point is, the deep insight is, if you have more than one objective, you, have more than, you need more than one instrument. What I heard 
was a multiplicity of objectives. <clears throat> Restore the Midwest, create high-value jobs, etc., etc. The assumption is somehow if we get the technology, it's going to give us all those other good things. Yeah. I question that because it seems to me it's too diffuse. If you want to restore the Midwest, have a regional policy. Yes, time for the segment. We now have the final one of the opening presentations, the second negative by Claude for six minutes. Robert uh, basically talked about whether we should do this. And the second question is whether we can do this. I have to say that I was, um, I have spent a lot of time moving in terms of the economics of this and the politics of industrial policy, but the first thing I did is you know, what's called the politics of industrial policy. And some of these issues have been around for a long time. And I was really reminded of that as I was looking um, at material for the last couple of days, I came across a very recent last two months, I think the three months, Piece by Jeff Softball, some of you may have seen this, in the Economic Policy Institute, which really goes back to the history, and I'm going to take one, 10 seconds on this, in which he basically blames, it's called the road not taken or the road, the long road taken or something like that. He goes back and blames all of our problems in terms of a non-industrial policy on the Carter administration and Charlie Schultz, <laughs> the head of the Council of Economic Advisors, which he said, in conjunction, by the way, this rings today, with Wall Street, Headed off other members of the Carter administration, other economists, as it were, um, in, in, in their push for industrial policy. And the point, uh, I, I suggest you uh, uh, the point that I want to make here is that the way he approached this, and this gets me to the point of the question of can, was wholly as a question of competing interest groups. And he saw this really as a question not so much of national policy or national interest, but, the, but, but you would have competing interest groups. And that, I think, is one of the problems that the United States particularly will face uh, in any industrial policy. And by, the, by this, we'll com come back to this. But I talked about a lot of general policy. When we're talking to today about picking winners and in specific tech companies or technologies, depending on how you define it. And there, I would argue that we now have, and it's true on the Republicans and Democrats, and certainly hasn't changed and with the new rules of the Supreme Court about uh, money and politics and so on, not going to change the, the most highly developed interest group state in the history of the world, certainly among democracies. And so the idea, we are not then ruled by philosopher kings. We are also not ruled by a bureaucracy, whether it's in the Commerce Department or the Defense Department or whoever, who actually <coughs> has the beginning or the final say in what we actually do. We still have the Iron Triangle. We still have the, interest group, the, the combination of a, of a committee chairman in a private interest group and a bureaucracy. And we have seen that actually, just to get specific industrial policy, in, in, in many cases, and we're about to see it again, in terms of energy. Think back to the debates of energy in the late 1970s, leading to the end of the Security Corporation, which actually, the way it was set up, would be to spread uh, goods all over the country. Indeed, that, to, to go back to Charlie Schultz, one of the, the criticisms that Charlie Schultz had of Laura Tyson's book back a little a decade later for industrial policy was that really our record here goes back to what we did in the Model Cities program, another different, a very different program, but it started out to target the worst uh, poverty region, or the worst poverty uh, portions of cities, you picked three cities. By the time the Congress got through it, we had 180 cities. And that, I think, is, will give you some sense of if we go forward in terms of, as a, as a widespread program, Yes, yeah, small programs. Maybe some of the SBIR, though there are other the small business uh, innovation program, though there are other problems with that, could slip under the, let's say, under the transom, because you wouldn't want it. But when you get to a larger program, you are going to kick in a whole series of interests. And the, Robert's point about guaranteeing a price, I think that any, that any guarantee, whether it's a price or whatever, given our political system, would not have credibility. And that has been the problem, I think, in, in, the, in the, en the public energy programs, uh, because corporations, no matter what particular energy, uh, energy technology they're pushing, know that they cannot count on the government to pursue the policy. There's one other final thing on this, this, this opening segment that I would like to say, and that is Rob, Rob Atkinson has talked about the fact that uh, I think it's a character that Robert Marx, uh, I think, began to rebut this, that some of our neoclassical economists think that 
Technology springs full blown just from investment and basic research. I would suggest that has not been true for decades. The work we did, and as I mentioned, Dick Nelson for us and Nathan Rosenberg, saw in the early, late 70s, early 80s already that the process, the linear, the so called linear <coughs> process of, of uh, innovation was, was not accurate. But that presents a worse problem, I think, for the government. Because now we know that it's a highly complex and very technical, technologically specific <coughs> process. And what you do in one technology might not, would not work in, the, in another technology. So that presents, I think, major problems for a government, and this is, I'm, I'm talking about even, even honest and highly trained bureau, bureaucrats to decide where the intervention will be. In fact, it's the complexity, not the simplicity, the inaccurate one that Rob Atkinson has put forward, I think, which, which really presents a problem. I'll just stop okay. and Thank you very much. So we now have a three minute questioning of Claude, and we'll move into the rebuttal round, which I'll explain after <coughs> three minutes. Hi. Uh, well, Claude, first of all, I, I actually do blame Charlie Schultz for, for much of where we are. Boy, Charlie, he's such a great guy. He may be a great guy. He's another part, but he's a great guy. He may be a great guy, but uh, he's uh, emblematic of the kind of neoclassical thinking that got us down this path. Uh, you raised essentially two questions, two, two, two common complaints. We can't do it because of complexity. We can't do it because of politicization. First of all, I have to say, by the way, Dick Nelson's recent book, Institutions and Economic Growth, I encourage you to read the chapter on Taiwan where he clearly states the reason Taiwan got rich was because they picked technologies. Talking about politicization, the Taiwanese Research Institute, whatever the formal name of it is, is one of the most effective institutions in the world. Those people are incredibly smart. They've got a whole cadre of people. They've picked technologies, and they've gotten the Taiwanese economy moving up. So I guess I have two points, I guess. One is this whole notion of politicization, it's already politicized. We do things, and you go look at the tax code, it's chock full of terrible, terrible tax provisions because some lobbyist goes over to the hill and gets it in there, and there's nobody fighting back. If we had a real strategy and a real set of experts in this country, and by the way, if we had neoclassical economists who stood up and said, wait a minute, this is bad industrial policy, this is good industrial policy, and use your analytical capabilities to say what's right and what's wrong, I think we could actually do the right thing. The problem is the debates just don't do anything. So there's very little research there's very little analytical support that can go to help policymakers do this. I would commend you to look at a piece by Richard Lipsy, a wonderful economist, non-neoclassical economist. And Richard surveyed the world and said, what do we know about what works and what doesn't work? So <coughs> quantitative research, and we do know. So I guess, um, you know, this last point that you know, nobody buys, you know, that, that I'm caricaturizing neoclassical economics. I actually don't think I am, but for the sake of the argument, let's say I am. The problem is that the people in Washington who have taken courses or read articles or whatever, they characterize it. I was in a meeting recently where I was arguing that we need a tax policy that explicitly promotes innovation. And the response I got from a treasury economist was, that's picking winners and losers. We all know that Robert Solow said technology is manna from heaven. So they at least believe it. <laughs> and the reason they believe it is because no one's arguing against it. Well, I guess on the, the first point about we have other bad policies. And so it seems to me what you're arguing is that just, we have other bad policies, so what's wrong with just having another bad policy? Uh, I, I, sorry, I just don't buy that. Uh, and you gotta get, let's get back to the specifics that you were talking about in terms of picking winners and losers. Uh, as Robert, Robert Lawrence started, and I, and I continue, it's not that I don't think the government should do nothing. There are lots of things the government should do, lots of things that you have suggested in your recent testimony that I don't disagree with. But we're talking today about specific <coughs> technologies or, or groups of technologies. And there, I think, I will go back to my original point, is that given the politics of this, and even if you had, in your terms, a neoclassical economist who would stand up and say this, I mean, for God's sake, whether it's Charlie Schultz uh, or, uh, or, or whoever else is head of the Council of Economic Advisors, they are not very large political forces in any White House. Okay, 30 second response? No, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to move into a rebuttal stage, and I'm going to give our uh, contestants a moment to pause and collect their thoughts and to explain the ground rules here. So again, the, the premise is the affirmative bears the burden of proof, so they went first, they're going to go last. So we're going to hear now in the rebuttal round, first from a negative speaker again. And these are four-minute segments with no question and answer, so we're going to hear a negative, an affirmative, a negative, and an affirmative. And the goal here is that any of the issues that we've been 
drawing out on our debate maps, things that have not been addressed directly are supposed to be addressed and wrapped up in this final round of rebuttals. So this is, we're going to have, we start with a, a negative rebuttal round for four minutes by whichever speaker would like to go first. So here's our, our negative rebuttal. So let me start by saying that um, I do believe there is a role for the government in generating research, basic research. And in addition, um, the government has uh, uh, the National Science Foundation, and uh, it, it gives large grants, and it can steer some of those grants to areas where um, independent panels believe there are opportunities and there are payoffs, and they may well be commercial and innovative uh, payoffs. So I am not averse to a policy which promotes uh, research and even research into uh, technological opportunities. What Clyde said that really worries me, though, is that it is clear that the concern is not simply that, but it is rather that these technologies actually result in being applied within the United States. <coughs> and that's where uh, I take issue, because it seems to me that um, if we're going to try to ensure that, we're going to have to take a, a lot of action, both through trade policies and through other policies, in order to make sure that that happens. And let's ask ourselves, who ultimately is responsible, for instance, to trade for trade policy? It's the Congress of the United States. So uh, it may well be, and Rob gave us a vision um, in which the experts somehow decide how the resources are going to be spent. Actually, if we could do that, I would think that the policy might be worth trying. But we can't do that in the United States, given our Constitution and given the way we allocate financial resources, because they go through a political system. And that political system has evidence an inability to behave strategically. Let's look, for instance, at our policies. We had a real strategic threat uh, after 9-11, right? Homeland security. And so the question was, what is the optimal way to spend our resources with respect to homeland security? What happened? Well, the Congress decided the most threatened areas, firstly, they had to divide it up among the 50 states. And so we have Peoria being singled out as a strategic threat, as a possible uh, being subject to strategic threat. We could not prioritize. The Model Cities Program is another example. We have to be able to prioritize if we're going to give large resources to the strategy. Can we drop the losers in a political system? It's not only about picking winners. It has to also be about dropping losers. How well can a political system drop the losers? And can we sustain the policies? Are we going to have a stable environment? You know, it could happen that this administration decides on something, but the question is, what will the next administration do? That was the experience of the Synfuels program. The Carter administration thought it was a great idea to commit billions and billions of dollars to a strategic policy, a strategic technology. They elected Reagan. He actually hung on for a couple of years trying to keep the policy in place, but afterwards it was axed. Now, knowing that, Knowing that we have a system in which we do not have a consensus, what would you do as a private <coughs> investor? Do you want your money to follow that government policy when you cannot depend on its reliability? I don't think so. So I think um, the United States in particular is not set up to um, uh, engage in this selective policy. Rob mentioned, and this will be my final point, that there were a cadre of experienced people in the government in Taiwan who were engaged in this policy. In other words, they have a permanent civil service which has uh, chosen experts and they remain there for a long time. In China, the Communist Party, you can bet, is, uh, has been there for a long time and is likely to be there for a long time. In the United States, will the people in the Commerce Department be there next year? I wouldn't fail. Uh, 
Thank you. Now for the first affirmative rebuttal round, we have five questions for four minutes. Bob um, <clears throat> Lawrence mentioned in his earlier presentation that the Japanese uh, decided this type of, uh, for <clears throat> no particular reason, decided that they were going to build cars in the U.S. <clears throat> This is a matter of thinking. This is a nice place to build cars. Well, I actually was involved in that decision, and I can tell you that that decision was as a result of the U.S. government telling the Japanese, "If you guys don't put some car plants in the U.S., we're going to lock you out." Uh, that was industrial policy, and the reason that the Japanese auto industry is vibrant and made the U.S. auto industry more vibrant is because we had an industrial policy in the early 1980s in that regard. Um, I heard both Bob and, and uh, Cora talk about the sophistication uh, of neoclassical economists uh, and the fact that they do recognize that there are marketing professions and so forth. And I grant uh, that Bob and Claude do. But I've just written a book coming out in May, and one of the things I did as part of the exercise was to review all of the uh, uh, Economics 101 textbooks, major popular textbooks. I could find very little about marketing professions, very little about uh, adversarial trade. There's some, but not very much. So Rob is right. The average uh, treasury official or journalist who's taken Econ 101 has basically been taught uh, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Hector O'Lean, and not, not much beyond that. Um, now, I think with Bob Solo is interesting. Bob Solo uh, says he doesn't know which ones. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter. There are a lot of opportunities out there. They, they, the thing is to pick a few. Uh, if you do nothing, uh, you're going to go nowhere. Uh, private industry doesn't make all the right choices. The government will make some mistakes. But I would say the track record for the government is pretty damn good. I mean, we've got. Uh, the internet, the web browser, the relational databases, uh, uh, <coughs> all kinds of uh, things that have come out of uh, government industrial policy. Um, let's take a company like Intel, uh, dominant uh, in the semiconductor industry, one of the world's top in industrial uh, technological companies. I can tell you Intel nearly went belly up uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, and Intel was, is here today in part because there were some uh, government officials. Uh, in fact, some of those government officials changed, but there were some government officials who knew that it was important to uh, do things to enable Intel to, to remain alive. And so, so there we are. Um, and I'm troubled by this notion that we can't do it, that we're too political. The fact is that, um, as I said, we will make decisions. We will make decisions about allocation and budget and regulations. Because we have no policy criteria, because we have not thought about it in any coherent, systematic way, those decisions will be and are politicized. You want to get politics out of them, have a policy and a systematic approach to developing some coherent thinking. Thank you. Thank you. For the final negative four minute uh, rebuttal, we have Claude Barbio. I'm going to leave any comment on what you said to the discussion that's only going to be said. One of the things that I think we ought to tease out, and there is just much more than Rob's writings and those of the Institute, is where is this limit, this complex uh, situation? Rob, Rob talks about you've got to go beyond basic research. I don't actually disagree with that. He talks about tar so tar at one point targeted basic research, now, but, and then and Pastor's quiet, and I know I'm speaking in code for something. I don't have any disagreement with that. That we had, that we that the book that we commissioned today, you know, we supported AEI in the early nineties with Rosenberg and Nelson and National Innovation Systems. We looked at that, but that was really what a lot of nations were doing. But, just, but it's one thing to say that you know that there are areas of opportunity, or you can guess that there are areas of opportunity in terms of research. It is another to get beyond that to say that you want to go, the government ought to be supporting proof of concept or demonstration projects. And there, what you get in a lot of the writings here is that that is counted as research. I would say that in the complex world, we, we, we agree is there, you need to think about where are the limits. 
And I think one of the most chilling things in one of the papers that Rob commissioned was the, the writer applauded the fact that people at the CIA, at the Commerce Department, the Defense Department, were uh, actually thinking as if they were venture capitalists. Well, you know, that's trouble. I think down the road it will end in tears. So that's one thing. The second thing I want to underscore in Robert Lawrence began is, <clears throat> that is that particularly with it, when we're talking about the energy technologies that we're that there, there's a lot of push to, to, uh, to invest in today. And Clyde mentioned the fact that we're behind in, in batteries and we're behind in photovoltaics. Uh, some of you, some, since this is a, an audience that's been around for a while, will remember a, a debate that I had with a very good economist uh, over at the National Academy of Sciences in the 1990s, Ken Flam. Flam had uh, done great work, I think, on trade policy. But in the, Bush, in the Clinton administration, he was in charge of creating uh, a flat panel industry out of the whole cloth. And basically, when I looked at the documents, um, I was starting to kind of sacrificial lamb at the time, just couldn't find anybody to, to, to debate it. This was a highly popular program. What was clear from the Commerce Department and the White House documents was that this was not going to be, it was a stupendous, uh, uh, would have been a stupendous program for demonstration. 15% of the world market by the year 2000 or so. But buried in those, the, in those documents was also a whole section on trade. And the point of this is we cannot allow the Japanese or the Koreans, who at that time were really moving into this area, to undercut us in price. And therefore, there will have to be a series of anti dumping actions, countervailing duty actions. So I would argue that implicit in a lot of these, in the, in the public investment, to, to, to advance technology is going to be a trade component. And particularly in the energy area where there's going to be a lot, there will be a lot of fights over the next half or even decade, you're going to, there will be the idea that other nations are not doing this fairly and that we must do it not just for subsidy, but protection. Thank you. With the final presentation and summing up the case, we have Rob Atkinson for the affirmative for four minutes. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank our two, uh, opponents for making a, a delicate case. Uh, fundamentally, I think that um, our position uh, essentially is, is the right one. Um, one of the key themes of this debate was that uh, neoclassical economics understands their market failures um, uh, and, and, and you know, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that um, there's this notion that these market failures are very discreet. They all pick one at a time and that uh, very sort of simple mechanisms can be used to address them. For example, uh, Bob talks about a CO2 tax and that would somehow bring about this nirvana of, of innovation in the green space. Let's just look at that for one second. There's a natural experiment that's been gone, going on for the last couple of decades in Europe. It's called the gas tax. There's a $400 a ton carbon tax, a de facto carbon tax in Europe right now, and they have zero electric cars. Uh, all they do is they drive smaller cars and they ride their bicycles more. So price alone doesn't get you what you want. It doesn't get you innovation. Um, the second component of this, I think, is uh, that the that we would argue that the market failures are so significant that it really has to ultimately, for someone looking at this, it leads you into a different frame. It isn't, it isn't simply a system where we can say, well, there's this failure here and we'll fix it with this little thing. Fundamentally, we have to, I would argue, abandon the neoclassical framework and start talking about what people in this field talk about are national innovation systems. We have a national innovation system in the U.S. We need to think about how to support that and how to advance that. The other component that I think the critique is, well, the experts, uh, if, if experts are going to decide, Bob talked about, yeah, and he said, well, if we can, quote, I think it was a quote, if you can do that, then the policy might be worth doing. Uh, and Claude talked about his support for Pastor's Quadrant, this notion of targeted. Well, let's look at what we have done in the U.S. We've done programs exactly like that. And these are the programs that have been vociferously criticized by neoclassical economists to get rid of them. Uh, for example, National <coughs> Science Foundation Engineering Research Center's program, vastly underfunded program. Uh, the Microelectronics Advanced Research Corporation that DARPA established to build our semiconductor capability. Highly successful program. Again, a program that takes a winner. Uh, the DARPA is a shipbuilding industry program. 
collaborative U.S. collaborative government private sector. We have the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program. We have the, what used to be called the Advanced Technology Program. There's a, I think it was uh, Bob maybe or Bob said, well, we don't have this permanent civil servants like they do in Taiwan. Well, I call Mark Stanley as permanent as we can get. Uh, Mark runs the ATP program. I guess he's retiring at some point. Uh, that's pretty permanent. Uh, Mark's been around that program almost since the inception, 15, maybe 20 years. Uh, and that program, I would question anybody who would call that program a politicized program. The reason ATP was attacked, not, was, not that it wasn't politicized, not that it was politicized. No one can make that claim about ATP. It was attacked because it explicitly picked winners. It picked technologies. So this notion somehow that we can't do it, it's going to be politicized, I would argue it's exactly the opposite. The reason we have problems in this country, uh, Bob talked about uh, Reagan axing sin fuels. Well, Reagan axed sin fuels because he bought into the neoclassical framework. If we had a consensus, which we don't, but if we had a consensus among all of us that said, yes, we can do this and we can do it the right way, uh, then essentially I think we could get to a point where we could say we could do the right policies and do it in a way that's, that, is avoid, that is avoiding politicization. We have a track record of doing that. The only problem is these are small little experiments because they can never get the support from the dominant neoclassical camp. And if we could get that, I think we'd be in the right place. So thank you, members of the affirmative and the negative. We're going to cast votes again in a few moments to see whose minds have been changed. But first, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative of asking our team to draw out and expand on a couple of the issues that have been left on the table. As I'm sure, again, we've all been mapping the flow of, of ideas. So I'm going to ask one or two of these, and then we'll cast our votes to see whose minds have been changed. Then we'll have a uh, question from the audience, and then we'll discussion. Um, there was, I'm going to ask if you're a member of the negative team who would like to address this. A theme from the affirmative was, um, yes, you complain the government will do this bad way, but in fact, if the government, uh, that these decisions are being made all the time anyway, and the only thing worse than the government <coughs> is meaning as the government not going to and there will be politics from other countries, uh, de facto politicization, et cetera. What's your response to that? Well, um, Um, my response is to try, what we see is the government behaves in this way uh, in all of the areas of our policy. Uh, so in a sense it's, it's a chronic problem. Uh, what I'm concerned about particularly in this area um, is that if we ramped it up on, to, on a significant scale is that it would look just like the rest of our policy. And um, so it would look like the agricultural policies which we have. It would look like the energy policies which we're currently implementing. It would look like the healthcare policies. So um, my response is we don't need another fiasco. Um, in an area where the private sector is um, extremely good, uh, this is an area in the allocation of resources where we do have a system not perfect, not without the need of regulation, not without the need of the provision of public goods, but a system which works better than I believe the government is going to be able to do. So, um, a brief reply to that I play on, I'm going to ask about some uh, issues for you all. One theme of the negatives argument, as you presented in various examples of success, is a version of the old joke. Well, that's all fine in practice, but what about in theory? That is, that there, you can find some various illustrations where you can contend this has been successful, but as a larger matter, these efforts will, over time, fail and uh, be bogged down. Can you make the case that these specific examples you're talking about for successes, as you did, Rod Atkinson, in your closing statement, that these are more generally typical of the likely success of government policy and not uh, anomalies? Look, and the problem with this debate is if we just sort of throw the spaghetti at the wall and say, oh, you know, something happens that's either good or bad, we know very, very clearly how to design programs that effectively pick winners. We also know things how not to do it. And we can go back in history and look at programs that didn't follow these principles, and lo and behold, they didn't do well. And those are the policies and programs that tend to get picked up by the opponents of picking winners. But we know what works, and we also have lots and lots of case examples. The ones I mentioned, uh, the Focus Center program at DARPA, the, the Nano Initiative that the Clinton Administration put in place, 
uh, what we're going to be seeing here in our national broadband plan. We know how to design policies and programs the right way, and I think the question really is not about will these programs get bastardized somehow. Historically, they haven't. They've worked. They've continued to work. The debate has never been, has always been about, well, we don't want to even do these good programs because that's picking winners. Let's have a straight up debate, and we would all agree, I think, that there's a, there are ways that are picking winners that are bad. I think the four of us would fully agree on a lot of those examples. <coughs> but what I would hope we could do is that the four of us could also agree that there are ways and means and mechanisms of doing it the right way that have worked and that deserve all our collective support to make it work even more. And that is a question to turn to the negative. Would you, if, if Rob Atkinson is stipulating that all four of you would agree, and probably everybody in the room, that there are bad examples, do you agree in principle there are good examples? I don't think there are really good examples of the government, the government taking things all the way through. I would take, I mean, the things that are thrown around would be the, the internet. Yes, you started with DARPA research, but you really would not have had the government take this all the way into. Don't go from DARPA research to the uh, new uh, Apple uh, gadget this, this, past, this past weekend. What, what you did with that was what, what the private sector picked it up. I'm not arguing. This, this game is what is the, what is. The, I, I do. I would disagree. Or at least I would disagree. Probably with myself. <coughs> we would agree that government is winners uh, and let Lou go. But if it is in that middle group, what can the government do to help uh, a particular sector or stop others from hurting it? That we might maybe we will have the debate. What specifically? And I would argue that uh, yes. To go back to the point that uh, you brought up on, and that is, I, I see no problem with you, whether it's the NSF. NIH or whoever is doing the automobile uh, research, uh, targeting areas that we don't know, that there is a public good, we don't know the, the, the science or the technology. Excuse me, beyond that, I think I would, I would just. So a question now for the affirmative too, a constant theme from, from the negative was that, again, it is so difficult to find this transition point from supporting general research to having a kind of specific commercialization that the father just talked about now, that is there a, in principle, a clean way to make this uh, make this decision? What would be your, your illustration to that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty easy, actually. Uh, Bob made the point that uh, he's not concerned about if we do the research, he's concerned that we also want the production to take place in the U.S. And my response to that is, well, wait a minute, what's the point of doing the research? I mean, if we're gonna do research, uh, so that the fruits of the research are uh, the production and the jobs are all elsewhere. We're not going to do much research. Now, so how do you how do you then follow through? And the answer is coming back to my point about Andy Grove. Innovation is actually not that difficult. But what tends to happen is you get into what's famously called the valley of death between the initial innovation and commercialization and scale. -up. It's in that valley of death where all kinds of things bad can happen to you. Uh, there may not be the infrastructure, may not be exactly right for you. Uh, it may not have the roads in the right place, or the internet might not be fast enough, for example. Uh, or uh, the uh, cost of, uh, of capital might be uh, very high for you, whereas you're, you're competitive with being subsidized in Japan or Korea with, uh, with cheap capital. Or uh, your exchange rate might be overvalued. <coughs> production very difficult uh, in your home base, so you move the production offshore where somebody is manipulating their exchange rate. So the answer is, um, let's have some investment tax credits, uh, let's have some coordination with government and industry so the infrastructure needs are, are understood and attended to by the government. Let's uh, have a currency policy that doesn't allow our currency to be uh, manipulated and distorted. Uh, and uh, let's have policies that deal with particularly the investment incentives, the capital grants, the free land, the free infrastructure that many other governments are offering to companies in the Valley of Death. Uh, Robert Lawrence, you wanted to respond to that. Yes. Um, the question is, a fundamental question is why are we doing the research? Now, suppose that what we're worried about is the environment. Suppose we're worried about CO2 emissions. If that is our goal, then we should try to achieve it at the lowest cost possible. And if it turns out that we come up with the innovation, but the product is more cheaply produced abroad, I believe we should do it. Um, we have a biofuels program. We're 
we're trying to promote the use of biofuels because there is a view that somehow they're good for the environment. We can debate that question. But simultaneously, we've imposed the tax on the imports of sugar ethanol from Brazil. So what's our goal? Is our goal jobs? <coughs> if our goal is jobs, let's subsidize employment, not technology. Let's take the taxes off uh, employment. Let's give people relief from uh, the taxes that are imposed when an employer makes a decision to hire somebody. So my view is we need to know what we want. We need to be precise about why we have these policies. Technologies are not a goal. Technologies are an instrument to achieving something. So let's be clear on what our goals are, and then let's choose the instruments that are most precisely targeted to those goals. I don't think we're doing it if we say we need technologies <coughs> because we hope, or maybe we're going to have to take some measures to ensure that they're applied in uh, our, our economy. Now, Megan said you have a concise response to that. Look, the goal is essentially productivity and innovation. We want new products and services, and we want high productivity. <coughs> there is no doubt that the literature clearly states that that's related to technology. And not just about invention, but about diffusion through the entire system with a range of technologies. This notion somehow that um, we don't worry, we should be indifferent to where clean technology is made might be valid if we weren't talking about the need for innovation in technologies. If all we're talking about is this is, this is like wheat or rye and it's some commodity and we only care about price on it, sure, okay, let's let it be made in China. That's not the problem. The problem is that uh, Erica Fuchs has shown in a very, uh, in a recent report that she did, we, what the Chinese essentially are doing is, is limiting next generation technology. So we're not, we can get current generation solar panels from China. We can get current generation wind from China. Their subsidies, their currency, their trade protection, a whole set of other things mean that this next generation of clean tech that we need so desperately in the world just simply won't get developed. And we're the ones who need to be developing it because that is our Ricardian comparative advantage. So it's, you can't just look at it from a, that's my other main complaint about neoclassical economics, it's very static, it's about <coughs> consumer welfare today. We need to think about global welfare in the future and American welfare. I'm going to intervene for one other round of distilled questions in our vote. I'm going to ask the member of the, the members of the negative team, either one of you, what is the central point you think the other side did not address? I'm going to ask the other side to address that in two sentences, the main complaint they did not address, and then we'll have you address it. Well, I think, basically, and I still, I think there's been no, uh, at least for me, no uh, explication or explanation of how one would choose the technologies. But how does one know? And how does one know enough to go beyond just the general kinds of, of support in terms of basic research and target research uh, that uh, we should go ahead? And a comparably concise response. Well, the technologies are, are pretty much out there. I mean, you know that, that some technologies contribute to <coughs> economies of scale, high productivity increases, we know that some of them contribute to multiple uh, effects across the economy. The internet is a good example of technology that diffuses across the entire economy. But this is not such a hard thing. I mean, nanotechnology, biotechnology, uh, advanced materials, you know, these are things that scientists and engineers and, uh, and uh, educated laymen know are going to have a big impact in the future. But the question really is, <coughs> Is the United States going to play the role that it competitively could play? And this comes back to the weakness on the other side. Rob is right. It's a static analysis. It doesn't take into account the issue that the United States could be competitive, uh, cost competitive, as well as technology competitive, in many, many of these areas. And the fact that it's not doing so is not because it doesn't have the resources or the capability on a market scale. It does. The fact it's not happening is because market distortions often imposed by foreign policies are preventing the U.S. from realizing the full benefit of its capabilities. I'm going to take Clyde's statement as also the concise uh, statement of what he thinks your side did not address. So what's the response to the second half of Clyde's question? Well, I think it is, is, is utter rubbish that... Um, now just, we're, now we're just to be explicit, <laughs> it, is, it is utter rubbish that economics 
concerns itself only about static efficiency and not dynamic efficiency. Um, uh, we have growth models, we have optimal control theory being used to see what is the optimal way to deal with things over time. And so I don't think that throwing in this notion uh, you know, of static versus dynamic helps this discussion. Uh, uh, the, the, the whole point is uh, uh, we do need to create an environment which encourages innovation. We do need to have rewards for innovation. Um, so we're not against government policies, whether they're regulatory, whether they're the patent system, whether they're intellectual property protection, whether they are giving finance to the National Science Foundation and to basic research and to uh, uh, students to study science and math. Uh, all of those things uh, are, are components on the supply side, which um, uh, and in, in creating an environment in which we will see innovation. So those are the legitimate problems of the government. Those are recognized public goods. That's where the thrust of the policy ought to be, rather than in the choice of specific technology. I just quickly then one of the problems with the, with the neoclassical argument is they can always say you know there's a, there's an NBER article in 1984 that mentioned this. Look, fundamentally, what we're talking about is what is the overall thrust of the neoclassical framework. Uh, my son recently took the AP test in, in, in macroeconomics, and the very first statement in the text in the book was, and I had to tell him not to read the book because it was all wrong. Uh, the very first one was, economics is about the efficient allocation of goods and services. That is principally what this is all about. That's not what economics should be about. Economics should be about how do we create added wealth Last point. Just, it didn't say you, point let me finish one point. 30, 10 <laughs> seconds. If you go and you look at every single macroeconomics textbook out there, the growth chapter, if there's one, which most of them don't even have a growth chapter, it's very, very small. It's, there's very little about growth and innovation in neoclassical. Nothing said. Just take that definition. The efficient allocation of resources. No one said at a point in time. It's the efficient allocation of resources currently and over time. That is what economics is about. I'm going to ask at this point, before we have uh, engage the audience in discussion, it's time to vote again. So vote of your agreement or disagreement with the proposition. Um, we will compare how those results stand both it were an hour and a half ago. And so then our, our technological wizards will sort these things out. So who would like to raise a question for a member of the panel? Please identify yourself and say it in the form of a question. Yes. Ken Jarbo of Dana Alliance. First of all, thank you for the blast from the past and back in my day. And the future, too. A full head of hair, and it was actually brown. Um, <laughs> as you guys know, I've been doing this stuff for a while. Um, there's an element here that is hidden. It's come out a little bit, Claude, when you talked about, uh, about, when you talked about trade. Rob talked about it with this uh, example of the wind turbines. Are we going to make them here, or are we going to get imported from abroad? the producer versus consumer line. Now what Charlie Schultz was really against in industrial policy was having a producer-oriented government policy because economic <coughs> policy was all about maximizing consumer benefit, lowest cost. How do we frame this producer versus consumer divide in this industrial policy? Who would like to address that concisely? Yes. Well, I, I think it's a really, really important point. I think that um, what sometimes gets lost in the debate is, is wages and income. Um, the thrust of, uh, of Anglo-American economics has been in total wealth, as you said. Uh, and uh, we always talk about, particularly in trade terms, that there are, you know, the gains of trade outweigh the losses. In other words, the consumer benefits outweigh the lost jobs. What is not addressed is the fact that um, that there are uh, negative impacts on wages and incomes uh, as a result of many of these policies, a lack of these policies, and therefore that uh, and this is a reason why um, most other countries, particularly <coughs> rapidly developing countries, put a lot of uh, em emphasis on producer wealth. Because their view of how that producer welfare raises productivity and incomes, which then allows greater consumption. Uh, and I think this is something, again, where neoclassical economics falls apart because its focus is so narrowly and so uh, 
So the logical implication is we want people to do more uh, innovation and more expenditures on R&D. The right approach is a tax credit or a subsidy somehow to enhance what they would do otherwise. So I'm in favor of it. But I'm not in favor of isolating it on information technology. Try to find what information technology is, for instance. And you'll see what a headache you'll have. So it's the idea that the government picks where the winners are, as opposed to the government isolates where the market failures are, and then compensates. The nature of the market failure we're trying to deal with is insufficient innovation. And therefore, our instruments and our uh, policies should be precisely targeted to where we, what we think the fundamental problem is. Um, so I'm actually quite in favor of something like an r and tax credit. And I don't know, quite honestly, whether the social returns are going to be greater if someone spends the next dollar in information technology or if they figure out somehow you know, to make a better widget. I don't know where that is going to be. I'd like the private sector to do it. I think the genius of the American system in charity is that the government doesn't decide where individuals should give their money, but the government gives a tax break uh, in order to encourage them to engage in socially beneficial activities. That's the kind of uh, technology uh, stimulus that I would like to see, not picking where they spend. You agree with this. I will go on record right now, and, and I will risk my entire future career on this statement. Uh, that there are bigger spillovers to IT when a company invests in it when they buy, than when they buy a couch. Uh, we should be treating furniture expenditures by companies, which are seen as an investment, and they can write those off with depreciation schedules. We should be treating IT differently than furniture. Now, Bob, I'm willing to say maybe we should include machine building, but are you saying no. fundamentally that furniture is no, the same research. as machinery? Research is what I'm saying. So no, no, saying, I, I'm, not saying, talking, I'm talking about investment. So we have a great difference. Let's just make it clear. You think if someone goes out and buys a computer, the government should subsidize that investment rather, rather than if they go out and buy a machine. Or a couch. Okay? Yeah. Right? That's or a couch for that matter. That's what you think. Okay. I don't, because the, the spillovers are not simply to a purchase of a computer. In my view, the spillovers come from what is called research. Okay, doing investigations on what is going to be um, uh, uh, profitable with innovation. That's what I want to encourage, not just invest. I just want to say, though, that, that my question about individual yeah. motivation yeah. has kind of somehow morphed yeah. into a discussion yeah. about companies. And, um, and, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on okay. motivate, because you know the fact is that there were more bachelor's degrees earned in information technology in the United States in the 1985-86 school year than there were in 2006, 2007. So that's the big thing, and it's about, for me, it's about motivating more individuals. I like your pointing out to come down to the level of the individual. I think that people should be able to operate like small <coughs> businesses and to um, deduct the expenses for their education more broadly. But what about a special tax incentive for STEM? Well, I, I, again, I don't want the government to pick with so, yes, so we have well, I think there, I mean, yeah. uh, this reminds me, though, of a, of a, of a proposal that Paul Robert had some years ago, uh, where he suggested that, the, that rather than uh, target universities, you actually target graduate students and I think that had a lot of sense. So they could take the money and go wherever they wanted. You could, the government broadly would go across very, very scientific fields. But the universities were not very happy with that. One can understand why. But, but Claude, are you? Are you willing to say, as I would, that I like that policy, and I think when Robert came up with that, but I would only target it to STEM. I wouldn't. I don't think we need to subsidize people getting a PhD in French literature. Yeah, well, there's no the the difference between just, just uh, uh, information technology as, as a narrow field versus you know all of science and all of science disciplines. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Gene told me. Didn't we do a little bit of both? Didn't we target some industries and and motivate people to study as a result of Sputnik? Didn't we direct uh, uh, research and what have you in, into the into the technology companies, the aerospace companies, and motivate people to do science and, uh, and engineering degrees? 
Yeah, yeah. No, no, the answer is, of course, we did. Yes. The point I tried to make uh, early on was that the U.S. has a long history of, uh, of industrial policy. I mean, really, from historically, if you look at the U.S. from about 1815 until 1950, we pretty much acted like China is acting today. Well, my point uh, being is that those that direction and that emphasis paid off hugely in jobs and all kinds of spillover. Well, there's two things to keep in mind. There, you, you're, you're, mixing, you're mixing two, two <laughs> kinds of programs. One was it certainly did produce a spate in graduate subsidy in graduate education and science and in technology and particular <laughs> space science. And secondly, you did have you did have a specific you had a specific target there, a hardware target of getting to the moon. And that's what we were spending money for. And surely you had one could debate. I mean, NASA has probably been always over. So the spin-offs, uh, but there was certainly some there. Because we, but, but that was a clear target of, of a particular technological goal, uh, as opposed to say energy policy that has other things beyond just the hardware that you create. But the spin-off of, of the much higher degree of computer technology, miniatur miniaturization of electronics, and it led to all other all other. other interrupt here with two housekeeping notes before more questions. See if you can come up in a moment and tell us the results of the polling. There's, there were a, a variety of conflicting times of when we're actually going to end. My executive decision will end at 11.15. So we'll have a lightning round of extra questions, and then people will hang, and hang around for more discussion. So quick questions and quick answers, I guess. Uh, I'm Ron Stoltz from Sandia National Laboratory. So thank you for mentioning picking losers, because that's really what the <clears throat> semi-permanent cadre of researchers in the national labs do. We, all, we identify losers. But my question for both sides is, what is the time frame and what is the process for arriving at a time frame for your expectation of assessment about winning and losing? And I hadn't heard that at all through the discussion. How about from the affirmative team first? How do you know if it's worked or not? Um, if you have success. <laughs> 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 no, 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 If it's working, I give you, I'm giving, let's pick a time, I don't know what the right time frames are, but let's say 10, 15 years. So if it's working after 10, 15, if after 10, 15 years, you ought to be able, you ought to be seeing that you've reached pre-future results. So if you have, your research in nanotechnology, uh, the researchers are going to set goals. Are they reaching those goals? Uh, if part of those goals include commercialization, are they going to those? Uh, I don't think that's so difficult. You also build in formal evaluation from the get-go. You have groups like the National Academy of Sciences evaluate these programs, or other groups that are objective and, and look at it on an ongoing basis. I, I think that's a great question, because I think um, there's, there's, uh, it's extremely difficult. And uh, things are always changing. The future keeps changing. You know, uh, what we think we know today, what we think we knew six months ago, it's remarkable how, how, how things change. So this is the great pitfall of putting a lot of government resources into the objective of commercialization. It turns out that uh, most projects, Mansfield, uh, Pennsylvania did a study, it's really interesting. Most um, innovative um, uh, projects within companies reach their technological goals, but they fail commercially. And if our goal here is commerce, um, we're in trouble uh, because uh, there's going to be uh, in, uh, on the panel, these experts are going to tell us, oh, we're doing fine technologically. What they haven't uh, really got a good idea of is, is it's going to succeed in the market. But if I come back to I mean, implicit in this discussion of the box comment is the notion that we're talking here about uh, backing you know, particular companies or backing a specific commercialization. I don't think that's what Ron and I are talking about. Um, we are uh, arguing, we're not talking for big government expenditure. Now, you can have a very effective uh, uh, industrial policy without spending much money. Uh, how you do your regulatory stuff, how you do your uh, uh, direct your purchasing, that's much more powerful than any kind of subsidy that you might be get. So I think the point that we're trying to make is that we want the government to be active in backing uh, technologies, and we want the government to be active in, uh, in compensating for market failures or in countering uh, market distortions. 
What about the scout in terms of what you, what you earlier talked about? You talked, we talked about Bitcoin getting, in 30 seconds. Getting, getting, uh, getting up through demonstration programs. We talked about, we talked about the bureaucracy as a venture capitalist. I mean, you talked about that. We said talk about that. Somebody has <laughs> that. You're right. It's, it's, in Rob, it's, it's in Rob's paper that, that you actually you should go into. That, that's got to be a particular company at some point. You don't have a consortium of companies. As a matter of fact, in terms of another quick thing, in terms of some things that Rob pointed to, and I would have no problem with this depending on what you're talking about, and that is support for consortium. I don't have any problem with support for consortium as long as it's research. And one of the, maybe one of the rules we should have is, yeah, the government will support consortium because we know we don't want your property come out of this. Or you, it has to be all widely licensed because that is the only argument from a public good stance that this has to be widely uh, uh, distributed in the economy so every company gets to it. Do that, maybe I have less problems. So I'm going to take three questions, which we'll do seriatim, and then we'll get the answers to all them so we can get in. Yes. Right, David Willis, Georgetown University. Uh, could the affirmative side give an example of a failed industrial policy, and could the uh, negative side give an example of a successful government policy, and what did you learn from that counterexample? Good question, yes. Okay, another one to on the table. <clears throat> Any others, or will this be our, our wrap-up question? Okay, well, that's a very good uh, final question. So, affirmative, give us an example of a failure, negative, give us an example of success. Yeah, we both had the same one. <laughs> Sin fuels. Uh, you know, failed industrial policy, in part because uh, it was ill-designed and, 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 and didn't have the analytical backing to support it. And it also failed one of the key things that we focused on in, 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 our, in our position, which is you don't want to target so narrowly. Uh, clearly what we should have been doing in the 80s was focusing much more on renewable energies and clean energies. That's what we should have been doing. Uh, so when Sinfuels comes up, it's sort of it's an example to me of, okay, we did it wrong, but we know, we know how to do things wrong and we know how to do things right. This isn't all that complicated. And, and the notion that Bob says that this, is, this world is way too complex, uh, then if it's way too complex, so why, why don't we just disband economics? Uh, why don't we get rid of the Federal Reserve? Why don't we get rid of the entire federal government? Because it's just too complex. We're supposed to be able to deal with complexity. That's what analysis is about, and I think we do know how to do things. So uh, yeah, I think there, there have been clear failures, and, but we know when we learn from them, they shouldn't damn the entire enterprise. An example of a success and what well, we're I'm going to redefine it in the sense that I, I think certainly in terms of my terms, in terms that I talked about earlier, when you're talking about to basic research, yes, uh, it made a lot of sense for the Defense Department to, for its own reasons, to fund materials research, or research early on in the 50s and 60s uh, re related to you know, high-end computing. It did not then go beyond that. Uh, it did it, 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 for its own purposes. It did, but that was that was then handed off. So I consider that this is not your normal view of industrial policy, but that kind of targeting uh, of, of government money going to things where you did not know there are lots of ca physical characteristics of materials you didn't know about. There are lots of things about about computing you didn't know about in terms of, of chips or things like that. That's the problem with that. I would consider that a success, and that's what I was talking about when I talked about it. Um, and, and would you affirmative to consider the existence of the U.S. aviation and aerospace industry as an example of successful industrial policy? Negative. Negative. Yes, negative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Again, yeah. 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 Um, I want to make a distinction. That they, the government um, has an interest in certain kinds of um, purchases. The government wanted to be, uh, us to be able to fly. Okay, so the government invested in that. That's perfectly legitimate. That's, that's in a sense, um, a, a demand-driven uh, desire on the part of a buyer who knows what they want. Uh, the problem is when you try to anticipate what the market will want. Um, so there will be spillovers when the government spends its money. As long as the government is directing it towards a socially legitimate objective, and I think in the case of you know, the development of jet aircraft, uh, given military needs, that was a perfectly legitimate objective, and it had immense spillovers. Uh, that's fine. It was a technology policy, but it wasn't targeted on competitiveness or on a commercialization. A last brief word to be affirmative, as is typical, and then we'll hear the results. Well, first of all, I do think we need to go beyond research and intervene in industry. The 
an example would be uh, in, the, in the mobile payments industry, where Japan and Korea are so far ahead of us moving down that path. We have none of it here. We're not going to get any of it here. Or if we get it, it'll be the wrong technology, because these firms alone are not going to develop this technology. But leaving that aside, let's just forget all that and, and stipulate but, that what we're talking about is strategic research or the past year's quadrant. If we could all agree on this panel that the, 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 the result of this debate is that we think we should, government should do a lot more of that, I would be incredibly thrilled because I frankly don't see the debate on this in Washington among the other side coming to the table and saying, yeah, we do need to do more strategic research. So I'm very, I'm, 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 I'm pleased to hear you say that, but I just don't hear it uh, in the broader debate. I hear that as picking winners. Uh, we shouldn't have a program on robotics research and develop research uh, or other things like that. I'm not talking about should we fund robotics companies. It would be a robotics research program. So if we can agree to that, to me, I would be thrilled. I think it's a success for the day. So let's agree on things we can agree on. First, there is much more to say on this topic, and there will be things to say about it over the years. Second, that we've had a really admirable and impressive and enlightening job by our panelists, for which I thank them all. And third, that we're now going to hear what this all means, because Steve Jordan will come and give us the results, where our minds change one way or the other. Steve, tell us what we're waiting to hear. Well, I don't know whether it was hometown advantage or horse of argument, um, and um, or fraud. Or fraud. Um, <laughs> and technology is impressive. I can't vouch for the uh, scientific accuracy of the poll, but we have a little movement in, in our, in our uh, thinking. Uh, in, in our our pre-debate poll was 48% agreed. Uh, we should have an industrial policy of sorts. 20, uh, 8% disagreed, and 24% were undecided. As we ended up with some movement uh, in favor of uh, agreement. We have 58, 20, or no, actually 60, 25, and 15. So, rather surprisingly, in Washington, some minds might have been changed this morning. <laughs> so, thank you all. Thanks to our debaters. Thanks to the host organizations. Thanks to all of you who have come, and we appreciate it. And we continue this discussion. And also, thanks to Jim for a wonderful job. Thank you.